Let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you have invited us to come before you to worship and praise your holy name. Grant that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Let your saving grace work in our hearts and cause us to grow in our faith and love. May you strengthen us for the week to come, that in all things we may live as your dear children and give all glory to your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please rise. We'll follow the order of service as you find it in the worship supplement, the service of word and sacrament, setting two, page 12. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Glory 
to God we give you thanks and praise of heavenly joy and peace on earth we sing we worship you to you our hearts we raise Lord God Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's only Son, you bore for us the Lord of this world, sin, O Lamb of God. Your glorious victory won. Receive our prayer, grant us your peace within. Alone, O Christ, you only are the Lord at God's right and in majesty most high who with the spirit <coughs> adored with all the heavenly host we glorify let us pray Almighty Father, in the glorious transfiguration of your Son, you confirmed that he is true God and true man. You confirmed his purpose in coming when he discussed his death with Moses and Elijah. You gave your own testimony from the bright cloud, confirming that you are well pleased with him. Be merciful to us and preserve us as your dear children, that we may also share in the glory of your Son, our Savior who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament lesson chosen for this Sunday, the Transfiguration, is taken from the book of Exodus. We read from chapter 34, beginning at verse 29. After coming down from Mount Sinai, after visiting with God, the face of Moses shone, reflecting the glory of God. This shining face unnerved the Israelites so that Moses covered his face until the brightness faded away. When Jesus was transfigured, his face also shone, not reflecting God's glory, but revealing it from within. Exodus chapter 34, beginning of verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put a veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. So far the words of our Old Testament lesson. Our epistle lesson is connected. It is taken from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians from the fourth chapter. We'll read verses 3 through 6. This is also our sermon text this morning. 
The Apostle Paul compares the shining face of Moses to the covenant of the law. The law had glory, but like Moses' face stopped shining in time, the glory of the law has also faded away. Jesus fulfilled it. The gospel of Jesus has greater glory and does not fade away, which is why we're called upon to share the gospel of Jesus and the glory that does not fade away with our darkened world that needs it desperately. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Those are the words of our epistle lesson and also our sermon text this morning. Please rise for the reading of the gospel lesson which is the transfiguration account taken from the gospel according to the evangelist Luke. We read in chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Jesus set aside his glory as God during his humiliation when he did what was necessary to redeem us, only revealing it in his miracles. But on the mountain of transfiguration, before he went the way of the cross, Jesus revealed his true glory as God, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothing was white as snow. The Father spoke from heaven, confirming that Jesus is God, and more importantly, that we are to listen to what he says. Luke chapter 9, beginning verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying... The appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is, good for, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days any of what they had seen. Those are the words of the gospel lesson for this morning. We continue in the worship supplement with the Alleluia, which you find at page 14. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Alleluia. These words are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. We continue our worship by together confessing our Christian faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed as you find them in the worship supplement, page 15. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The Word of God upon which we meditate this Transfiguration Sunday is our epistle lesson, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. These are the words. In the name of Jesus the Christ, this world's only true light, fellow redeemed in his precious blood. It's easy from time to time to get down and question this ministry. After all, our little group seems to get smaller and smaller every year. Family moves away, we have funerals every year, and the congregation gets smaller, the church emptier. We might begin to ask ourselves, are we doing something wrong? We've been on the radio many times telling the community what we're all about, and still no one comes saying, I heard your advertisement on the radio, and I'd like to hear more about this Jesus. We're on the church page in the Mining Journal. We have a Facebook page and a website. Anybody looking for a church ought to be able to find us easily. And yet no one comes saying, I read your article. I'd like to know more about this Jesus. 
We speak with friends and acquaintances. We invite them to worship. Still few say, I enjoyed that. Can you tell me more about this Jesus? It seems that people don't want to hear or to join Calvary. Do we need to make some radical changes? Do we need another reformation? Do we need to change our message because, well, it seems nobody wants to hear it? Actually, that would be the worst possible thing that we could do. If your lamp doesn't seem to be lighting the living room quite the way it used to, do you just throw it out? Or do you check to make sure it's plugged in, the fuse is not burnt out, and the outlet, or the, the bulb rather, is actually working? It isn't the message of the cross that needs to be replaced. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we find this encouragement in the second letter to the Corinthians. Don't hide the light. Let it shine. Because our world of darkness needs it. And because that's the reason God has entrusted it to us. May God the Holy Spirit then light a fire under each one of us through this Word of God that we rejoice and share the light of the world with others. Amen. Transfiguration Sunday is the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany and a precursor to the Lenten season and for good reason. During the season of Epiphany, we've been looking at just who this Jesus is. We've learned that he's the Son of God and we've witnessed his power in action as we've studied the seven signs from the Gospel of John. It's very important that we remember that Jesus is the Son of God during Lent because during Lent he doesn't look much like the Son of God. As he lays aside his power and conceals his glory and goes the way of the cross and the grave. On Transfiguration Sunday, we see Jesus' glory before he goes the way of the cross. We hear how Jesus took the three disciples up on the mountain to pray, and as he prayed, his face was altered, and his clothing began to shine brightly. It wasn't the first time, as you heard, that someone's face shone brightly. The book of Exodus tells us the same happened to Moses after he went up to Mount Sinai to receive the law of God. His face shone brightly, in fact, so brightly, that the Israelites were afraid to look at him. Moses put a veil over his face until the brightness faded away. In the third chapter of this second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul compares the glory of the law of God to the glory of the gospel of Jesus. He explains that the glory of the law is like that shining face of Moses that faded away because it was temporary. Jesus completed and fulfilled the law of God. The gospel of Jesus is different. Its glory will never fade away. For this reason, he tells us that we should boldly speak the gospel of Jesus. He explains the reason why the Jews don't believe in Jesus is because the truth is hidden from them, much like that veil hid the face of Moses from the startled Israelites. He tells us that the glory of Christ is also hidden from many in our world today. And we can help to change that. That's why we're given this ministry, and that's why Calvary Lutheran exists. Since the glory of Christ is far more glorious than the glory of the law, we are urged not to hide the light, but let it shine, because our world of darkness needs it. Verses 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Christians for many years have asked the question, why do some people believe and others don't? It's thought to be a mystery by some Christians, when it really shouldn't be a mystery, because Jesus went to great lengths in the parable of the sower and the seed 
to explain why it is that some believe and others don't. Jesus pictured his word as like seed planted on the ground. In some cases, Satan takes away the word before it can put down roots. In other cases, people believe, but when trouble comes to them, they turn on God and turn from him. In other cases, people believe, but earthly things become more important than their relationship with God, and so they turn from him. And finally, some do hear and believe and bear fruit. There are forces at work that seek to undermine the spread of the gospel of Jesus. And sometimes those who undermine the truth have actually come from within the church itself. A Frenchman by the name of John Calvin once declared, God is sovereign. In other words, what God wants to happen will happen. Sounds really good, doesn't it? And it's kind of true. He concluded then that if God wants someone to believe, they're going to believe. And if someone doesn't believe, it's because God didn't want them to believe. Hold on a second. Kind of expect that from a Frenchman. What he concluded was an offense to God's word and to God's love. Because in the scriptures we're taught simply, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved. Did you get that? All people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Frenchman was way off. But if God wants everyone to hear and believe and be saved, why do some hear and yet not believe? We find part of the answer in this letter of 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul tells us that if the good news of what Jesus has done is veiled or hidden, it is hidden from the unbelieving, those who are perishing. And who is the one who has hidden it from them? Is it God? No, not the triune God, but the one that the Apostle calls the God of this world. He has blinded their minds to keep them from seeing the glory of Christ, that he is in fact God. I think you know who this God of this world is. He's not a God at all. He's a fallen angel. We know him by the name of the devil and Satan. And many in this world idolize Satan. It is his work, it is his goal to hide the glory of the Lord Jesus from the world. And he's very often successful. Isn't that obvious? In part because those who have seen the light are timid and afraid to speak up. Why do we hide the light? Honestly, there are different reasons if we ask ourselves that question. Sometimes we're afraid of the consequences. We're afraid that people will make fun of us or think less of us. Sometimes we decide beforehand, well, it's just not going to work. This person's not really interested. But we really don't know what's going on in their lives. Don't hide the light. Just because Satan has fitted those who do not believe with a veil doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit can't change that. Just because Satan has blinded some doesn't mean that God in his mercy can't enlighten them and show them the light. For Satan may be called the God of this world, but he's only a created being. He's only a fallen angel. The creator himself stands behind each of you. He's the one who spoke and this world was created. He's the one who sent his son into this world to save sinners who were in the dark. He is the one who, by the Holy Spirit, can cast aside the veil. Don't hide the light. Let it shine. Don't give up on the world. The good news of what Jesus has done is what the Holy Spirit still uses to convince, to convert, and to enlighten sinners. God, through his word, turns on the lights. He did it for Paul. He did it for you. He can do it for others. 
Don't hide the light. Our world of darkness needs it. Jesus can overcome the darkness he has in the past, and he will in the future. Verses 5 and 6. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When I'm fishing by casting a lure, and I don't have any success, I change to a different lure. After all, I have a bunch of different styles and colors in my fishing tackle box. I really don't know why the fish aren't biting. Maybe there aren't any fish where I'm fishing. Maybe the water's too murky and they don't see the lure. Maybe they aren't enticed by my lure. Maybe the lure I am catching only catches fishermen at the store. I don't know if there's really a problem or not. But because I'm impatient and not successful, I change my lure. When we look at our congregation and see it dwindling, and we really don't get the results that we want when we go on the radio or in the newspaper, we may be tempted to make a change. We really don't know that there is a problem with what we're doing. In fact, it may be that the right people are hearing the message, but the devil is getting in the way of their coming to us. It may be that they're reading their Bibles and the Holy Spirit has lifted the veil for them, but they've been led to a different fellowship. We don't really know that there's a problem, but we become impatient. We look around and see the empty pews, and we're tempted to change things up. But we dare not do that, for that would be to change our God-given purpose. The Spirit of God reminds us here that when we leave this place and go out into the world, we are to remember that we are not Lord, we are not leader, we are not master, not any one of us. We follow Christ. He is the Lord. He's the one that gives us the marching orders. And trust me, he doesn't say, this is Pastor Schaller's church. Listen to what he says. Look through your Bible, you never find that. He says things like this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It isn't just that Jesus is the Lord, is our master, is our leader. It's also that we are servants of God and of one another. It's sometimes been said of certain congregations that there are too many chiefs and not enough Indians there. In other words, it seems that there are more people who think that they're in charge than there are people who want to actually serve. Is that a problem here? Let's remember who's the leader and who the servants are and follow his direction. We are servants, every one of us. God has removed our veils so that we can help other people to see the truth that Jesus is God, our Savior and theirs. Don't hide the light. Let it shine. Remember who entrusted us with this work. The same God who said, let there be light. And there was light. Who also brought the sun, the moon, and the stars into existence. The same God has lifted the veil from our hearts. So that we see God's glory. Not in the sun, moon, or stars. But in the face of Jesus Christ, his son. God has entrusted us with the same power that has enlightened us, the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that we let it shine, not cover it up. 
if that message could change a murderous Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus and remake him as the Apostle Paul and send him into the world to save sinners, then just think what it can do if we actually share it with other people. Don't hide the light. Let it shine. It's the reason God has entrusted us with it. Do your part. Speak of Christ. And the Holy Spirit will do the rest. Let us pray. Give us lips to sing thy glory, tongues thy mercy to proclaim, throats that shout the hope that fills us, mouths to speak thy holy name. Alleluia, alleluia. May the light which thou dost send fill our songs with alleluias without end. God the Father, light creator, to thee laud and honor be. To thee, light of light begotten, praise be sung eternally. Holy Spirit, light revealer, glory, glory be to thee. Mortals, angels, now and ever, praise the Holy Trinity. Amen. And the peace of God, which far surpasses our human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus till life everlasting. Amen.
Heavenly Father, on the mountain of transfiguration, you reveal Jesus Christ in his unveiled divine majesty, and by testimony out of the cloud declared him your Son, whom you love. Help us always to believe and confess that Jesus is God to the glory of your name. In commanding us to hear your Son, you have placed your divine blessing in all that he has spoken. Grant us grace to hear his wonderful words of salvation with steadfast faith, so that we do not dread his final coming or fear his judgment. Gracious Father, to know Christ by faith is to know your love, to possess your forgiveness, and to share with all saints the hope of everlasting life. We thank you for giving us this knowledge and faith. O Jesus Christ, though glorified on the mountain before witnesses, you nevertheless humbled yourself, even to death on the cross, for our sins. Make us willing to suffer for you, to risk all that we have, if necessary, even our lives, in order that we might better confess your name and teach your gospel to others. Precious Savior, you are appearing in glory in the company of Moses and Elijah, and speaking to them of your approaching death proves that the prophet's words, foretelling a Savior from sin, are fulfilled in you. The apostles, too, were eyewitnesses of your glory, and declared the same before the world. Teach us to listen to the testimony of the prophets and apostles given in Holy Scripture, so that we never fail to worship you as the Savior of sinners and Lord of all. Those on the mountain were happy to see your glory, even for a passing moment. How blessed all of us will be to spend eternity with you in heaven. Graciously grant, therefore, eternal life to us, forgiving our sins, erasing our doubts, destroying all confidence in our own good works, and increasing and sustaining our trust in you through your word of truth. Comfort us with the bright hope of your coming. Care for our needs and preserve us from all things physical and spiritual that may bring us harm. Of your rich grace and endless mercy we ask it. Amen. An additional prayer has been asked this morning on behalf of Ron Nimi, husband of Linda, who is undergoing a procedure. We pray. Heavenly Father, you hear and answer our prayers because of our Lord Jesus, who intercedes in our behalf. We come to you on behalf of Linda Nimi's husband, Ron Nimi, who is undergoing a procedure. We ask that you comfort him and give him the needed courage to face the day and the results. Grant that he may face the procedure with confidence, trusting in your steadfast love and protection. We know that you neither slumber nor sleep. Let this be an assurance to both Linda and Ron, that they may rest at ease and be neither worried nor afraid. Relax their nerves, put their minds at ease, and graciously forgive all their sins. Give the surgeon a steady hand and the necessary understanding to do his task with ease. Give the family confidence that you are with them, keeper of both body and soul. Calm any troubled spirits during the upcoming hours. In your precious hands we place his well-being for time and eternity. We come to you in the name of our Savior Jesus the Christ, who himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. the announcements here in the bulletin. First off, uh, Sunday School will begin shortly with the Transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, Bible study will follow Harmony of the Gospels in the Fellowship Hall. Tuesday Confirmation Class at 4. Wednesday, we have the Soup and Sandwich Supper. Uh, is it 5 o'clock? Is that right? 5, 5.30, something like that. Before choir, and then Ash Wednesday service at 7. Ladies of Calvary meet at 7 in my office on Thursday. It's a week early, but that's what we decided the last time. Uh, Sunday, our worship is at 9.30 with Sunday School and Bible Study to follow. Uh, final game day of the winter is planned for Sunday, March 20th at 3 in the Fellowship Hall, if you'd like to uh, join us for that also known as Snack Day. <clears throat> the Lenten season begins this coming Wednesday. Um, I'll be preaching here the second one of the series, Two Evil Leaders. Uh, the following week, we're going to be a lot of order here at Calvary. Uh, the one crucial hour, uh, my youngest brother Caleb will be here for that. Uh, the voters uh, decided last Sunday after worship to officially act on James Goodman's resignation from the treasurer position for health reasons. It was decided that Mr. Ewers would be added to the checkbooks to sign checks in an emergency situation. Uh, the voters may need yet to elect someone to the council and officially decide who serves as treasurer. Perhaps we could have a very brief voters meeting afterward and just take care of that. On the back table, there is a Lenten calendar, a devotional calendar for the Lenten season, if you'd like a copy of that. Uh, feeding and housing, the tour choir, we've talked about this. Um, this past week, uh, I did an extensive look at a number of local hotels. You see the list there. And uh, made a reservation for seven rooms at the Days Inn, which includes room for the bus driver, which the school will pay for, so we only have to come up with a six. Uh, cost is about $95 a room, and will include the hot continental breakfast, which is kind of what we we're looking for. Uh, those who have agreed to house students should speak to me. I expected to have an invoice for that to give you an exact number this morning, but it wasn't sent to me in time. Um, I will get you that information as soon as I have it. Uh, CLC Call News is there in the bulletin. Also, the offerings from last Sunday and devotional readings for the coming week are on the back of the bulletin. Is that everything? Is there anything else? Okay. Uh, Lord be with you. <clears throat> 